Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Shaheen, and I'm from the greatest public university in the world, UC Berkeley. So go Bears. <laughs> and I have an outstanding panel, uh, all friends. And some of us would call us transportation geeks. We just think we're really cool. Uh, and so we, what we want to do is talk to you a little bit today about some of the issues that we think are really important in transportation and transforming our transportation system in the 21st century. And one of, I think, the big questions that we have in front of us relates to this incredible level of innovation that we're now seeing in, in the transportation sector and how we might need to evolve public-private partnerships in light of that. So I'd like to turn to each one of you to see what your perspectives are on that question. Um, you know, I spent the majority of my career in the private sector. I'm back in the private sector. Uh, but I spent five years in government. And I can tell you that there seems to be a fundamental misunderstanding on both sides um, of, of the other's motivation and what the relationship should be. And it's not just about data. And I think that came up this morning a number of times. You know, we tend to get focused on data and technology for the sake of data and technology. And it's really about people and relationships and change management. And, you know, I was the vice president at Zipcar back in the early days. And I can tell you that um, when we were able to negotiate with the city to put cars on the street um, and uh, put them in uh, disadvantaged neighborhoods, uh, which we didn't necessarily want to do on our own, uh, and to share our data with the city, that reciprocal relationship uh, made the difference, and I would say that's also when we became profitable. And so I think these partnerships can be really advantageous for the private sector more than they necessarily initially understand. Thanks, Gabe. Emily? Yeah, I Thoughts? think <laughs> we're in this new kind of environment with transportation now where instead of the traditional model of the public sector controlling the provision of public transportation and then the alternative to that being just private vehicles, which obviously the public sector didn't have the same ability to monitor, there's this middle space where now there are a lot of different private companies like my own that are providing a platform for transportation with an unprecedented ability to capture data about the activity that's happening on that platform. And that presents just a tantalizing opportunity for those who are interested in trying to understand transportation behavior and those in the public sector who really want to make sure that they're making the best expenditure of public resources when they plan their own public services or look at planning and demographic trends and land use decisions. So I think that there is a really strong impetus on both sides for a collection of accurate data that can help inform the provision of better services to the public. But the challenge lies in the fact that you know, part of the value and the intellectual property that we have as a company is our software and the, the algorithms that our hundreds of engineers spend time building. You probably know we're in a competitive space, right? <laughs> we have very well-funded uh, competition and, and part of the advantage that each of us seek to have against one another lies in that technology. So I look at my role within Lyft as trying to be an ambassador to reconcile those tensions and to identify a subset of information that we can get willingness within the company to share externally to public partners who you know, can put it to use for public benefit without compromising those competitive concerns or the privacy of user information, which are both sensitive issues. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? Is there a sweet spot for this exchange of data between the public and private sector? Yeah, I, I think there is. And you know, if you read the press, this sometimes looks like you know, government says, give us all your data, and the private companies say, no, you can't have anything. And um, <laughs> fundamentally, that, that isn't how it, how it operates, and it isn't how it should be, because we have some, some shared interests. But I do think it's important for us to, to recognize what the interests of government actually are when it comes to transportation. Within the systems themselves, we have a responsibility to look at access and equity and non-discrimination and safety. These are you know, core values, public policy goals that we have a responsibility to, to, um, to make sure are, are present in our uh, broad transportation network. So you know, we have a, a data sharing agreement uh, with uh, Uber, which we think we're one of the, the first city to sign one of these. And 
um, one of the things it's allowed us to do is start to look at some of those public policy questions. We can ask that question of, you know, does, uh, do some of these new services provide a uh, more equitable service to neighborhoods that are lower income? Are they, uh, are they widening a gap or are they helping us to close it? Um, it, there's also some, as I think Emily alluded to, incredible opportunity around uh, the things that are not directly related to transportation, but which flow from that. Uh, questions of housing policy, where do we build, parking requirements, uh, the way we divide up the public street. Uh, the data that I, I think there's a, 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 a belief upon, uh, that we all share on this, uh, you know, on this panel that these new modes of transportation are going to be hugely influential in helping us grow our cities in a way that's uh, ecologically sustainable, in a way that's um, you know, that actually doesn't lead to endless congestion. And so there's this huge opportunity and, and one that's going to require research partners to really get to, to try to figure out, you know, how does a car share service, a, a, a company like Lyft or a, a bridge, a bike sharing, how do these influence behavior, right? If, uh, if we know the way in which the availability of these services reduces the likelihood of you taking a trip in the car by yourself or buying a second car for your household, that helps us make smarter planning decisions. I think that's a, a key piece of the sweet spot. Um, there's one more area, though, that I think is important, which is there are things that are really just about how government and cities can run better that these companies can be a partner for. So we have a, another data sharing agreement with Waze, um, the, the, the app, and they provide us with really high resolution data about the uh, congestion on streets, traffic jams, things like that. So we're using that to actually help uh, inform policy and the way we manage the roadways. Uh, we're running a pilot right now where we're increasing enforcement of double parking, and then we're using Waze data to measure whether that improves the flow of traffic. And that's another kind of uh, place where there's, there's shared interests at play. Fundamentally, from our perspective, we recognize you know, business has proprietary information, they have a need to protect that, but if your business model is dependent on having a well-run, thriving city, then you have both a, a moral obligation and a business self-interest in working in partnership with government and researchers to make the cities run better. I really agree with that, and I think that the key word there is partnership, because we know that you know, there are different levers that government has to exact cooperation from the private sector. And one of those levers can really be partnership. It can be finding ways for there to be shared value for the companies as well as for government in entering into those cooperative relationships. So I think we'll get into this a little bit more in our discussion later on. But um, there are ways now that we can start to integrate our services, public per services with private services, um, creating more connectivity between public transit and private transportation options. And those present some of the best opportunities for government to um, ask for data in return about utilization. Mm -hmm. Great point. So why don't we move on to a topic that uh, we have been just so fascinated by at UC Berkeley and we're trying to do more and more work on it, and that's this issue of accessibility. And as we bring more and more technology to the table, we face this challenge of potentially leaving some people behind. And that's not what we want to do with technology, but it is challenging, let's face it. Not everybody knows how to use a cell phone, an app, and a lot of people don't even have smartphones, right? So how do we integrate all of these new technologies in a way that helps us to cross the digital and the income divide, but also allows us to get out of the core area of these cities into more suburban and perhaps even rural areas? So what are your thoughts on that? Um, you know, I'll just say, I usually come at things from a consumer perspective, but in this case, this is where the data is so important. You know, as, as Yash was saying, you know, we have this opportunity to uh, redesign our cities um, or, or reallocate space in our cities with all these new technologies that are allowing people to shed automobiles, right? And so, um, if we have the data to do better land use planning, right, to add more density in our cities, if we can enhance our transit systems, which they desperately need, so that they continue to be the backbone of our transportation networks, um, and then services like Lyft and autonomous vehicles, and all of these things become connectors, then I think we can provide more equity for people. So it's not just making sure everybody's got a smartphone and they understand how to use the apps, right? It's about, do we have the information that we need, and are we using it properly to actually create um, 
an equitable lifestyle for people. We're pricing people out of cities right now. And we, uh, and I say we in government because I spent so much time in government and I work with NACTO and other organizations on this, but we need the data and the information to make the right arguments and also to help companies like Lyft to actually integrate in a better way with public transit. Because I think there's a lot of concern out there right now that like the MBTA, uh, could become a secondary system because we've underfunded it for so long and some of these new options will appear to be lower cost and easier. Mm -hmm. Great point. Emily? Yeah, I think, you know, the availability of funding to extend equitable transportation access into all areas of, of the cities and regions where we live has always been a huge challenge for the public sector. Mm -hmm. And we look at the chronically underfunded public transportation systems in this country. I mean, the gas tax has not gone up since right. Bill Clinton was president. So, and we see actually declining reliance on fossil fuels that are the main source of transportation funding. So there's a larger conversation happening about the sustainability of funding for public transportation, but I think one of the greatest opportunities in these new private services like Lyft is the fact that in many instances with our more flexible models, and in some cases um, services that are peer-to-peer -peer, like Lyft that don't require the outlay of capital expenditure in order to um, expand transportation access into new areas that might have lower density, lower ride frequency, that presents an opportunity to increase the mobility of those communities and do so at an affordable price, an increasingly affordable price. And and that will be an important part of it because scale is tremendously important to making these services accessible at a cost level. So, for example, when we launched our Lyft Line service, which as many people may know is the pooled ride option that Lyft offers where you can decide to share your ride with another person and get algorithmically matched with another group of individuals or even multiple groups that are found going the same way as you at the same time, that allows us to really shift the demand curve for Lyft by making it more available to more people at a lower price point that people get in exchange for that willingness to share their ride. Um, and once we can get more and more commuter drivers who are already going somewhere and choose to make themselves available when they're traveling um, to a place that they're already going, um, that will allow us possibly to, to make the service even more affordable. Yeah, Emily, you and I talk all the time. And one of the things that I've found in the research we've been doing for almost two decades hmm. is that a lot of these services do attract people who are younger, upwardly mobile, tend to be Caucasian, and live in core areas. What are you guys seeing in your data now that you have LiftLine on board? So, you know, there's certain data that we get from our users, but it actually doesn't include a lot about demographics, right? What we know about um, utilization is more geographical. And so we infer things from that about the equity yeah. of our service, right? We don't actually collect data about, um, you know, someone's age or their race or their income level. But we can see where their origins and drop-offs are and make pretty good uh, judgments about what their income level might be. And what we've seen is that looking at the origin and destination pickups and the fulfillment rate of people actually getting rides and the wait times that they have for those rides. For example, when we looked at the city of Chicago, we found that there was actually no difference in how um, successful folks were in getting rides based on the socioeconomic characteristics of where they were. And in fact, in many cases, that had been very untrue of traditional services or public transit services in those areas. So we believe that we are helping to close the equity gap. It's really exciting. I I, really? I, would, I would add to this, I mean, I think it's, it's commendable that um, companies like yours are, are looking at ways to make their services uh, affordable and accessible to a broader population. But there is a fundamental difference between public transportation and companies that are doing this for profit. There are customers for whom, <laughs> there, are, there are customers for whom it will never be economical for you to serve, no matter how optimized or uh, advance these, uh, the, the, you know, the, the services that you're offering get. And I think when we look at it through a public sector lens, you know, the, the, one of my least favorite phrases is, well, government just needs to run more like a business. You know, businesses get to choose their customers. We don't. Okay. And that means that we have to make sure that we are looking across the full spectrum of everyone, regardless of age, uh, physical ability, technical ability, income, and trying to work towards a high degree of equity for everybody. Um, and part of that, as I think Gabe very correctly pointed out, is we need to be able to see how we're doing. We have to hold ourselves accountable to that. And we can do that with public transportation services, with uh, certain traditional modes where we have existing uh, measurement tools. But with some of these new, me new modes, we need to actually have 
uh, true partnership, not just in the cases where it's, uh, everyone's economic interests are aligned, to try to get to answers for some of these questions. I mean, at the end of the day, I think this issue of um, you know, is, are, you know is, are services like, like Lyft, are they, are they uh, preferential for people with, with technical ability? Yes, probably to some degree. But, you know, we heard today the, um, from some of the folks in Oakland how much that landscape is changing and the digital divide is shifting. Uh, there isn't going to ever be one mode that works for everyone. Um, I have tried, but I cannot get my mother to try the bike share. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to keep trying, but I'm, I'm not all that hopeful. Um, ultimately, we want to put together a pool of services that when we look across the population, we can say, you know, we are doing a good job between public, private, subsidized, uh, of delivering mobility to everyone in our communities. Um, and I think there is, there's partnership opportunity here. There's incredible work for the private sector to do in this space. Um, but if we don't take that frame of everyone, not just everyone that's economically mm -hmm. profitable to serve, then we're going to miss uh, the real goal here. And there's a tremendous role for research in that. I mean, th I think there are opportunities to create safe spaces for sharing of very detailed data. And Susan's a researcher. I, Susan, do you have any thoughts about what the role of third parties can be in helping to facilitate greater understanding of Absolutely. the equity of our services? I have thoughts on that. <laughs> <laughs> You don't say. <laughs> I'm going to steal your moderator hat yeah, for a second. Absolutely, Emily. No, uh, we would be delighted, and I know all of the universities would be delighted to, to serve as a role as a third party to help store the data, protect the data, yeah. and also to analyze that and provide that you know, objectivity that I think the government might be looking for when we do assess impacts, sociodemographics, that type of thing. So thank you. I think Gabe had something well, to add. He was, was smiling gonna, at me. So. I, I was going to ask you if it's a <laughs> cop-out to agree wholeheartedly with both of these people, even though they're on both sides of the equation. And I mean, that's actually why I wrote the book Startup City, because I think actually we want the same things. And I think like this is an issue of scale often. Um, I actually think, oh, and you have to parse the data a little bit, because we want to support public transit. We want to support high quality, good public transit. But a lot of times, you know, I hear, you know, like white liberals saying, you know, we need to make sure we provide this equitable bus service in this neighborhood. And the bus runs every 45 minutes and only goes to one place. And it's not very equitable. So I think on the public side and the private side, we got to come together and figure out what are the core services that government should provide that, that they're doing well? Mm -hmm. And what are services, let's say paratransit, um, you know, that Lyft, Lyft couldn't provide that service, but there are other uh, companies that can at half the cost, like actually taxis in Washington, D.C. are doing that at half the cost with a voucher program. So I think we've got to really dig into it, and we've got to figure out what's actually equitable versus what's just sort of cool to say that's equitable. And um, I think if we do that, we'll be a little bit surprised where we come out. And I think if we work together, there's this opportunity to save a lot of money provide more equitable service, and a lot of it has to do with scale. And just real quick, back to the Zipcar story, um, you know, when we did this contract and uh, uh, DC said, you've got to put cars in these low-income neighborhoods, and we're like, oh, okay, that's going to be tough. And guess what we learned? We learned that within two or three months, those were the busiest cars in the entire fleet, mm -hmm. because everybody needs transportation all the time. Right. And convenience and flexibility. Right. You know, we can't all spend an inordinate amount of time taking a bus. Right. And but we, we all face issues with kids, right? You and exactly. I both have kids and we talk about it. It's like you sometimes you need instant access to get to a doctor or something right. like that. And and bike sharing, I just want to say bike sharing is one of those things if you blow it up and make it big like like we did in Chicago and, and D C, you'll be surprised. Um, you know, you, you have the early adopters, which sometimes are the young you know, white people, or like in, with Zipcar, it was the, um, back then it was the crunchy crowd, you know, and, and, and that was great. But then you mainstream something over time and you bring it to every neighborhood in, in the city. So where you start um, to make it successful is not always where you end up. Mm -hmm. Great point. So you started us into this discussion of you know, public transit mm -hmm. and how do we preserve the core services but how do we evolve public transit to, to make it more accessible, bring it into areas where people are not served or they don't provide the frequency of service? What are your thoughts on how we can evolve this? And I just want to hint a little bit that I would love it if you guys would talk about automated vehicle technology and, and <laughs> other, other stuff like that. <laughs> thoughts? Well, I mean, I don't want to talk the, the whole time, but I have lots of thoughts. <laughs> no, I, yeah, you do. <laughs> 
<laughs> Actually, why don't you start? Emily, then sure. I, this in. is something I'm devoting at least half of my time to right now because about six to eight months ago, we started to receive a whole bunch of inbound interest from large public transit agencies saying, hey, we noticed that you are now a legitimate you know, service that's been authorized by our government and that there are millions of people that are using your service and others like yours to get around our city. How can we use this network to help make public transit work better? Because there are limitations to the places and times of day that can be easily served with traditional public transit infrastructure. If you've got a 40-foot bus, that's a pretty blunt instrument, especially operating on a fixed route. And so there are only so many places and such a certain frequency that you can bring that. Um, so they are really interested in how they can um, tap into private networks to supplement the service that's offered by public transit, not replace it, but supplement it to bring mobility access that doesn't require people to own a car into places that traditionally haven't had that. And that's exactly the same problem that we're trying to solve. So we are actively engaged in one of those discussions, many of those discussions actually, but one of the parts that I think is the most fascinating is around technology. Because what's happening right now in public transit agencies around the country is that they're starting to move into the world of software for fare payment. Without getting too wonky around transit fare payment, <laughs> uh, that's one of those traditional systems where folks have procured multi-million dollar, you know, closed uh, gated systems with smart cards that are really expensive, but now they're looking to the next generation. They're looking at smartphone-based mobile ticketing apps. And once you're in the world of software, that can open up the opportunity for APIs to be integrated from a number of different types of transportation services, public services that can sell fares through those apps, but also services like Lyft, bike share, car share, that could all be integrated and could be implemented into a trip planner function within those public transit apps to help people piece together journeys across multiple modes and maybe even pay for them with a single method of payment to book rides across multiple modes and to, to see how easy it can be to rely on this ecosystem instead of a private automobile. I, th I think that idea is, is key. Like if, if we look at cities, uh, m m we'll see much more through multimodal transportation in the future. Uh, that idea that a service like Lyft could be incredibly complementary to uh, a public transit system. You may choose to take the train in the morning knowing that if you're stuck, work, stuck late at work that you'll be able to get a car home at a convenient time and at an affordable price. You know, thinking about those unexpected things of having to pick up your, your kid from school. And I, I, Emily spoke to this very well, but there's a whole set of enabling technology that will help make this multimodal world uh, work well. There are tools that help people plan journeys uh, more effectively. You're seeing things like Ride Scout and City Mapper that are combining modes of transportation and saying, hey, if you take the bike share to the train, that's going to be faster than uh, any one single mode. Um, the payment issue is a huge one, and it's a huge one both from a convenience standpoint, but it's also about lowering barriers to entry to trying a new mode of transportation. Uh, if trying the bike share means you have to go to a website, sign up, get a key mailed to you, or spend five minutes trying to figure out this little kiosk, you're a lot less likely to do it than if you can just walk up and through whatever mechanism you're using to pay for the other parts of your journey, pay for the bike share. Uh, and so I think these kinds of enabling uh, uh, shifts will be part of, of making this multimodal future. And then there are things that we can do within the, the physical and virtual infrastructure to help support this. Um, thinking about transit stations, not just as places where trains and buses go, but as places that integrate bike share, that integrate pickup and drop off spaces for different kinds of on-demand transportation. Uh, this sort of notion of a mobility hub uh, is something that will be a, a big part of, of making all of this come together. And there's a data piece of that too. I don't know whether Lyft is, is doing this yet, but you think about the idea of a, 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 a company like Lyft monitoring uh, commuter trains and uh, knowing that, hey, there's a train that's running late, but it's going to be pulling into the station in 30 minutes. Do we need to signal our drivers to be in the vicinity so that they can you know, help take people on that last mile of their journey? A lot of opportunity here. Absolutely. I mean, even think about service interruptions that happen on transit systems, unexpected service interruptions, mm. um, where there's usually kind of a period of scramble as the agency has to contact bus bridges to assemble 
um, alternative vehicles to get people from one stop to the next available stop. And we've heard some interest in looking at, well, maybe there could be a way for there to be a relationship where um, those agencies could actually signal to, to Lyft drivers in real time to be the sort of the first responders to help get people across until the larger capacity bridges or repairs can be established. So there are a lot of opportunities for collaboration when doors are opened around sharing real-time communications about our, our data on both sides. Wonderful. Gabe, any I have very little thoughts? time left. We've got um, 15 seconds. <laughs> um, you know, first of all, I just want to leave people with a thought that, you know, there's an old saying, a good transportation plan is really a good land use plan. And we get so caught up in transportation and we really need to focus on land use, as, as you were saying, and, you know, multiple modes in one area. But I think with the advent of all this technology, you know, automated vehicles are going to change the landscape completely. And, um, uh, government being at the forefront and not putting their head in the sand and actually shaping the change versus what they did with Uber and Lyft, which I think often was to put their head in the sand and then things just sort of happened to them and they, they lost the chance to create equity or, or uh, open data, wh whatever the things were that they wanted. So I want to see government engage. I want to see the companies be more open to the engagement and, uh, and this realization that the road isn't free um, you know, we talked yesterday about how driving is the most subsidized form of transportation. And so whether it's companies like Uber and Lyft or FedEx, I mean, the access to the roads, which are paid for by the public, are really important. And there, and there needs to be that trade-off. And I think if the private sector engages in that trade-off, what will ultimately happen is their business will get better as it did with Zipcar. Well, you guys, I want to thank you as always, for uh, talking with me about these topics. And I'd like to ask all of you to join me in giving them a round of applause. Thank you.